some of us are waiting on God to give us access to something that we have no idea we already have access to it because we don't realize I don't have it not because God didn't give it. I don't have it because the enemy is blocking it. Verse 16 says this, now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with the spirit of divination met us who brought, who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. Y'all got that? There was a slave that was demon possessed. The demon was able to tell fortune and their master made money off of this demon possessed servant. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, these men are the servants of the most high God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed. Notice it didn't say he was stirred with compassion. It didn't say he was broken hard. It said he was irritated greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. Somebody say, pastor, leave it alone. I should leave it alone. But the Bible was clear to say a male demon came out of her. Leave it alone. Keep going. But when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. And they brought them to the magistrates and said, these men being Jews exceedingly trouble our city and they teach customs which are not lawful for us being Romans to receive or observe. I try to leave it alone and I can't leave it alone. So give me 10 seconds just to hang out right here. You have no idea that there are people in your life that don't want to see you free because they profit off of your bondage. You have to open your eyes and realize there's people around you that like you broken because your brokenness makes them feel better about themselves. Your brokenness allows them to manipulate you. Your brokenness allows them to move forward in life. I pray that God would open your eyes, that you would see the people around you who want you free, but you would also see the people around you that are benefiting from your brokenness. They brought him to the magistrate and said, these men being Jews exceedingly trouble our city. They teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. Then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrate tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them in the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. But at midnight. Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were open and everyone's chains were loosed. The prison, the purpose, and the praise. The prison, the purpose. And the praise, Father God, we're grateful, we're thankful. You're here. You're healing, you're moving, you're restoring. Spirit of God, breathe on us afresh. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, somebody shout, amen, and amen, and amen. Have you noticed that the more technology advances, the less aware we become. Do, do, do you remember back in 1995, 99, 
2003 when you had your best friend's phone number memorized? Anybody remember back in the day when we used to memorize phone numbers? You could pick up any payphone and boom, 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 boom. Now, first of all, I ain't seen a payphone in about 15 years. But if there was a payphone, I, 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 I regret to say, I don't even know if I could call my wife. <laughs> As I'm sure with all of you guys, your boo, it's not even their real name in your phone. It's like emoji, emoji. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you the emojis that are my wife and my phone, but... Can I hit there for just for a moment? Ain't it awkward when you're a phone and somebody in the car driving and the phone pops up on the... <laughs> and it says peach, peach, apple, plum. And you're just like... <laughs> oh! <laughs> off, off, <laughs> off. <laughs> but as technology advances is wild how we become less and less aware it's to the point now whenever I'm driving my car and I'll park face in in a parking space whenever I back out I don't even look anymore why well two reasons it started with the fact that the backup camera will turn on so I'll just look at the backup camera if I don't see a human there But now the car that I have, it has like one of those like accident sensors. So I don't even look at the camera anymore. <laughs> I just jump in a car, put it in reverse and, and I figure if there's somebody back there, I'm here and... <laughs> Don't stand behind my car. I'm just. <laughs> but it's wild how the further we go in advancement, the less aware we become of our surroundings. Yeah. And I fear that's what happening in the natural is a mirror of what's happening in the spiritual. That the further and further we advance in life, the less and less we become aware of our surroundings. And we're so unaware of our surroundings that we think an annoyance is just an annoyance. We think a bad day is just a bad day. We think a frustration is just a frustration. We think when somebody comes across our mind that that person just came across our mind. We think when I have this sense of I should slow down, I should pause or whatever, that it's just a premonition or a sense or whatever it may be. We've come up with phrases, deja vu and all this other kind of stuff to try to explain away the fact that we do not just live in a natural realm. We also live in a spiritual realm. And matter of fact, the Bible says that the spiritual realm is more real than the natural realm. I, I, I always try to put myself in scripture as I'm reading scripture. And I just imagine if I were Paul or I was Silas and I was walking through this city trying my best to preach the gospel. And there was somebody that was shouting out and screaming at the wrong time every moment. The Bible tells us that Paul was actually annoyed, and, and I, I like Paul. Paul. Paul's the guy. He wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. I, I should not trash Paul, but it is impossible for me to preach without trashing whoever I am preaching about. It took Paul three days to realize that this person that was following him, that did not grow up in church, 
and did not know how to say God is good all the time and all the time God is good and probably didn't know a job from Job. (laughs) But what I've never heard preached before was was she trying to annoy them or did she see freedom on someone that she knew she did not have and did not know how to articulate that she wanted what they had, but she said to herself, if I can just stay close enough to the freedom that I wish I had, maybe, just maybe, what is on them will rub off on me. And it took three days for them to realize that she wasn't there to annoy them. She was there for freedom. And I wonder how many annoyances I have brushed off in my normal journey through life because those around me knew that there's something on me, that it's been on me so long I've become numb to it. But they seen it says they have something that I don't have. The prison, the purpose, and the praise. Can you write this down? Not every annoyance is a hindrance. Not, not every annoyance is a hindrance. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17 says this: For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but are the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. I am, I am, uh, I'm, I'm getting nervous preaching because every time I preach, you hear just a little bit more of how messed up I am and... I try to hide it and I try to kind of look all buttoned up, but it just leaks out of every message. And since we're leaking now, (laughs) there is something about people who chew with their mouth open. There's something about people who will not let their soup cool. (laughs) There's something about people whose parent did not teach them. You wrap the spaghetti around your fork. You don't put the tip in and... How do you still have teeth in your mouth the way you grit that fork every time it comes? I'm done eating. (laughs) My fork is down. My knife is down. I'm just like, when you're done, let me know. I'll begin my meal, but I can't eat under this adverse environment. We'll be out to eat with somebody and my wife will look at me and she's like, you're not eating. And I'm like, (laughs) how often do we let somebody else's annoyance bring our purpose to a complete halt? Somehow we have believed the lie that I need a perfectly calm and peaceful incubator to walk in joy to walk in peace, to walk in purpose, to walk in godliness. So now I've got one person in my life that doesn't know where their joy is. And I let them steal my joy every time I encounter them. I've got one person in my life that has no vision for their life. 
And because I've got this codependency thing going on, I actually halt the vision that God has for me because I feel guilty about them not being able to keep up, not realizing that that annoyance that you're experiencing does not have the ability to hinder what God is looking to do in your life. Matter of fact, that annoyance is an indication that there's something on me that God wants transferred in this moment. But first, I I've got to become aware that there is something on second Corinthians chapter three, verse 12 says this. Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. Watch this. Unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. This is talking about Moses in the New Testament when he led the children of Israel out of captivity, out of Egypt. They would have the tabernacle where he would go in and he would meet with God. And the Bible says that every time Moses would come out of that tent, that the people would know that he had met with God because his head would glow. And because the people have never met with God for themselves... And they had this idea that God was like Pharaoh who wanted to destroy them instead of bless them. They were afraid of God. And because they were afraid of God, they were offended by the glory of God on Moses' life. Hear me. Don't be offended by every single person who is offended by you. And don't be intimidated by every single person who is offended by you. Don't go in the mirror and say, oh my gosh, am I prideful? Oh my gosh, am I arrogant? Oh my gosh, am I what they say I am? Maybe you are. Are. That's what Freedom Conference is for. But maybe it's that they're offended by your God and they can see your God on you and they don't know what to do with it. So they're like, uh, you're extra. Uh, you're a lot. Uh, I don't want to hear it. Uh, get away from me. And here's what we do. We do what Moses did. We put a veil over our face and we try to blend in with the other people that don't have the same glory on them that we have. And here's what God sent me to tell you, take that veil off and show your joy. Take that veil off and show your boldness. Take that veil off and show the fact that yes, there is something on me that did not originate in me, but originated in the God on me. And I don't say it from a place of arrogance. I say it from a place of you too. Come on. You, you ever been in a restaurant and you order your food? And then an amazing plate comes by and goes to another table. And you're like, waiter, waiter, excuse me. What's that? What they got over there? And the waiter goes like, oh, that's, that's not on the menu. Oh, but but, but I, I, want, I, want, I, want, I want that. The Bible says that our lives should be an aroma to the world. That when we walk by, people say, whoa, 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 excuse me, excuse me, waiter. What is that joy? What is that peace? What is that boldness? What is that confidence? What is that humility? What is that? And we can say, actually, it's on the menu. <laughs> you too can have it. Write this down. I need... Prison worthy purpose. I need prison worthy purpose. There's not a person in this room right now that everything you want, you have. Now, some of you are arrogant enough to say, Pastor, that's not true. There's nothing that I want that I don't have. It's probably because you're thinking I'm talking about possessions. But if you live long enough, you know possessions are the easiest thing to get. It's easier to get possessions than it is to get peace. It's easier to get a new car than it is to get unity in a marriage. I'm not talking about stuff. I'm talking about only things that God can do. 
God, I need peace. God, I need restoration. God, I need healing. God, I need you to open this door. All of us, because we live in a broken world, there is something that we are believing for. There's something that we are longing for that we do not yet have. And I have made the mistake of sitting back and waiting for whatever it is I'm believing God for, for God to bring to pass in my life. I, I, I remember this one time I left my car keys and, and, and I ended up getting locked out of the house. I shouldn't tell you that the kids were in the house. That's not part of the story. <laughs> but I was locked out of the house and I called my wife and I said, babe, I can't get in. And she had a good laugh at me. And she said, do you not remember that there's a keypad? Do you not know the keypad to get into the door? And I didn't want to admit to her that when she was explaining to me how it worked, I wasn't listening at all because I didn't think I would ever be in the situation where I needed it. And now I needed the information and I did not have the information, but I had to call somebody to let me into something that I had the ability to give myself access to. I just forgot the fact that I had the ability to gain access to it. Some of us are waiting on God to give us access to something that we have no idea we already have access to it because we don't realize I don't have it not because God didn't give it. I don't have it because the enemy is blocking it. If you go on in Acts chapter 17, Acts chapter 18, Acts chapter 19, it's wild because the Holy Spirit was poured out in Acts chapter 2, and we obsess over Acts chapter 2, but what happened between chapter 2 and chapter 17 is the church actually turned their back on the Holy Spirit. And they were trying to do the things of God in their own strength. And in Acts 17, 18, and 19, Paul reintroduced the Holy Spirit to the church. It was actually the first great awakening. But in Acts 16, the enemy knew what God was getting ready to do through Paul's life. And he said, let me try to block him. Let me try to hinder him. Let me try to slow him down. Let me try to block what God is getting ready to do. Let me get his a focus on something other than where he is going. Union Church, God sent me to let some of you know that you're not waiting on God. God is waiting for you to realize that that is the enemy in front of you trying to block you from what he has for you because he knows that there's a miracle on the other shore waiting for you. As you study scripture, there was always an attack of the enemy in a transition. When they went from one side of the sea to the other side of the sea, there was a storm that was waiting in the middle. When they went from Egypt to Canaan, there was adversaries in the wilderness waiting, trying to hinder them from where they were going. Some of us have been crying because, God, I haven't seen this promise come to pass yet. And you've got to turn your tears into joy because the fact that you're blocked is an indication that the enemy is afraid of what God is getting ready to do in your life. The fact that it is taking longer than you think think it should take is an indication that I must not quite know what is on the other shore of where I'm going. Because if I knew what was on the other shore, I would know why the enemy is so anxious to keep me from getting there. What's wild, and I'm praying that God opens your eyes, is the enemy believes in you more than you believe in you. I'm doing good, Josh, because I could preach it in a way that was like, oh, but I'm intentionally keeping it vague and biblical to not get us tied off on different things, but just tie in whatever you can tie in, whether it's the marriage that you're waiting on whether it's the resources that you're waiting on, whether it's the influence or the open door or the opportunity or the business to take off or whatever, do you really think it's just about you? Do you really think that God doesn't have an amazing supernatural plan for that future marriage? Do you really think that God is not planning on using that child that the doctor told you you would never have to be a prophet to the nation? Here's what happened. The enemy has tricked you into thinking that your dream is selfish. Hear me. It is not selfish. It was put inside of you by Almighty God to show his glory here on earth. And as soon as you admit that this dream ain't from me, this is from God, then you would realize God's got a plan. Of course the enemy is going to try to... Isaiah 
Chapter 6, verse 8 says this. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here am I, send me. Your delay will make sense when you realize you're on a mission. Your hindrance will make sense when you realize there's a call of God on your life. The mountain in front of you will make sense when you realize there's a miracle on the other side. But as long as you believe the lie of the enemy that the goal that you have is just about you, it won't make sense to you why the enemy is trying to block you. But as soon as you realize, no, 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 I'm called by God, I'm anointed by God, I'm assigned by God, and there's a miracle on the other side of this moment that is going to show the glory of God, then all of a sudden you realize, I'm not waiting on God. This is the enemy trying to block what God has for me, and I know how to deal with the enemy. I know how to stir my faith up. I know how to speak to mountains and see them removed. I know how to decree and declare what God said in heaven to come to pass here on earth. Where's the birthday boy at? I'm done. Last thing is this. I can never let my praise die. There's certain things... Look at your neighbor and say, it's just a matter of time. If I got maybe not emotionally honest, but just a little honest, can you not judge me? There's certain things that I don't pray about. And I've been doing this for years, and it's not arrogance, it's just, it's going to happen. I didn't pray about going to college. I knew I was going to college. Because my dad said, go to college or I'll kill you, so. <laughs> I was going to go to college. It's not that difficult. I didn't pray about when in the house. I learned you work and you save. You get out of debt and you buy a house. There's just certain things that it's just a matter of time. But then there's certain things that it doesn't really matter how much time I give it. There's not much indication that there's any chance of that coming to pass. That's where faith is needed. Certain things, it's going to happen. Discipline, wisdom will produce it. But there's certain things, it don't match, matter how much wisdom I apply. If God doesn't show up. There's, there's no chance. It says... But after they arrested Paul and Silas and they beat them, put stripes on their back, it went as far as to let us know they did not put them in prison. Peter was in prison. Paul and Silas were not in prison. They were in solitary confinement. The Bible says that they put them in the prison, inside of the prison, in, in the inner prison. And if the inner prison wasn't enough, it says after they put them in the inner prison, they shackled them. Why are you going to tie me up when I'm already in a situation that I couldn't get out of? And even if I got out of this inner prison, the only thing it would release me into is to the outer prison. There's literally no victory in getting out of this situation because it just puts me in another bad situation. 
Here is Paul and Silas beating, bleeding, and bruised in solitary confinement, shackled, singing. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like, like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Just, you can read your Bible the way you want to read your Bible, and you can believe what you want to believe. I've heard it preached that Paul and Silas praised and an earthquake brought their freedom. But when I read it, it says when the clock hit midnight, they were already singing. It didn't say that they started singing at midnight. It says that when midnight struck, they were already singing. And by the fact that they were already singing when midnight struck, when the earthquake took and brought their freedom, I, I just feel that the purpose of their praise was not to incite an earthquake. I think Paul and Silas were just as surprised at the earthquake as the jailer was. I think Paul and Silas was just praising God because that's what they did. I, I don't think they expected to be set free. I don't think they expected an earthquake. I just think that they knew, wait, there is a call of God on my life and he has brought me the, too far to leave me where I am. I don't know how this is going to turn out, but here's what I do know. The inside of the inside of the inside of a prison shackled to a wall is not how my story ends. I think Paul just sat there. There is no way God would have knocked me off of my horse, blinded me, sent Ananias to open my eyes for me to die in this prison so that magistrate may come and open the door. God may walk in with an angel. I don't know how it's going to work out, but here's what I do know, that when I invite the presence of God into this prison, that something is going to shift, something is going to change. And then at midnight, as Paul and Silas were singing praises and hymns unto God that the earth began to shake and the doors fell off and shackles came off and freedom broke into hear me where praise was already happening can I preach something you may have never heard preached before don't praise to get out of your prison Because if I praise to get out of my prison, then praise is a manipulation. I'm not praising to get out of my prison. I'm praising because I know my prison can't hold me. So I'm not concerned about the prison in the first place. All I'm concerned about is inviting the presence of God to where I am in this moment. And as long as I know how to invite the presence of God where I am in this moment, everything will take care of itself. So the doctor says there is no way you can have children. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praises shall continually be in my mouth. Your employer says, I'm sorry, but you don't have the skill set that we're looking for. I will bless the Lord at all times and his praises shall continually be in my mouth. That long-term relationship walks out of your life and doesn't turn out the way that you I will bless the Lord at all times and his praises shall continually be in my mouth. You can't see the progress that you're believing God for. I will bless the Lord at all all times and his praises shall continually be
We're going to praise in about two minutes. And some prison doors are going to come flying open. But can I pull one more thing out? I'm done. Tap your neighbor and say, why are you sitting down? Get up, get up, get up, get up, get up. Come on. Sorry, guys. Sunday morning, I'll let y'all miss a moment. But I can't let you miss a moment of Catalyst. the person next to you say just get in the room just get in the room just get in the room there's just just there's just certain things in scripture if you could turn my mic up a little bit there's certain things in scripture that blows my mind I think the people who praise should be the only people whose shackles fall off I think the people who praise should only be the prison doors that come flying open but that's not what our gracious God says in his word the Bible says that two people were praising but all the doors came open the Bible said that two people were praising and all the people who were just watching got freedom I wish you understood that what's on your life doesn't just set you free, but everybody who dares be bound around you, their shackles are going to fall off just because your shackles fell off. Everybody that dares be locked up in your presence just because you're praising, their prison doors are coming flying open. Can I tell you what the church is? The church is a place that understands my praise is bringing freedom to every single person that lives in my home, every single person that's sitting on my row, every single person that dare lives in my neighborhood. Union Church, you've got about 60 seconds to lift the praise unto God, not just for you, but for your family, for your loved ones, for your neighbor, for your coworker. Lift the praise unto God that makes depression fall off. Lift the praise unto God that makes blind eyes open. Lift the praise unto God that puts purpose and hope and destiny back on the inside. I won't be silent. I won't be quiet. My God is alive. How could I keep it inside? I won't be quiet. My God is alive. How could I keep it inside? I'm going to praise the Lord, oh my soul. So they were singing praises on God. The prison doors flew open. Everybody's shackles fell off. And Paul just sat there. The prison guard came running, ready to kill himself. 
Paul said, don't kill yourself. Everybody here. The prison guy said, what must I do to be saved? Because I've never seen people not run away from a prison when the door is open. As you drive home, just preach this message to yourself. That prison didn't bother Paul. If it did, he'd have ran out the first shot he got. But he so knew who his God was. That he said, I'm going to sit right here in the purpose that God has for me. And it will come find me. There's some of you in this room, there's some of you at Columbia, that truth be told, you don't have the energy, faith, or hope to praise yourself out of that prison. You dragged yourself in this room and you don't even know why you're here. Can I tell you why you're here? Because God knew that you'd be sitting next to somebody that had the freedom on their life that you so desperately needed. So I speak to every prison shackle of depression, of fear, of insecurity, of anxiety, of bondage. We break it in the name of Jesus and we decree that you are loosed in the name of, right where you are, come on, can you just lift your hands? Father God, we thank you that you are breaking off every bondage, every prison door is flying open in this moment. God, that you are releasing a praise, you are releasing a joy, you are restoring a life, you are downloading a purpose and a destiny, you are speaking life and life more abundantly to every single person under the sound of my voice. Come on, somebody shout amen. Amen. The Bible says when the prison doors flew open, hear me, that suicide was the first thing on the jailer's mind. Here it is in the atmosphere of praise. Somebody was thinking about taking their life because they did not know that what freed Paul and Silas could free them as I don't know who you are but I know that you're here and I know the thoughts that you've been battling and what you don't know is the same power that freed the person next to you is accessible to you in this moment come on pray this prayer say Lord Jesus I believe that your death brought me life, that your blood brought me freedom. I reject death and I receive the life of Christ. I surrender. Use me for your glory. In Jesus name, amen and amen and amen. I'm going to pray for you and I'm going to let you go. I uh, got a text message um, from 
one of our uh, members that's a doctor at the church. They're an anesthesiologist. They said, my patient just walked out of the room and said prior to the treatment that I was giving them that they were in so much pain, they were contemplating suicide. And they looked at me and they said, doctor, you have no idea. You literally saved my life. And I texted the person back and I said, it doesn't matter what we do. It's all ministry. I'm going to pray over you for 20 seconds and we're going to praise and I'm going to let you go. But here's my prayer. That your eyes would be open to two things. One, to the presence of God on you. And two, to the mission in front of you. That when you leave this house, there are family members and co-workers and neighbors and friends that are counting on what God has placed on your life. No pressure whatsoever. They don't want you. They want what's on you. It's the God on you. And God said, freely you have received. Now freely give. Come on, can you lift your hands? Father God, I pray over every single person under the sound of my voice. God, just like Ananias came to Paul and laid hands on him and scales fell from his eyes. God, I pray right now that supernaturally scales would fall from the eyes of every single person under the sound of my voice. God, for that fitness and structure, that school teacher, that doctor, that lawyer, dear God, every single person that they would know that it's not just a vocation, it is an assignment, it is a calling, God, that we would realize that every annoyance is an opportunity for a demonstration of the Spirit's power. God, give boldness, God, give joy, give purpose, and perfect every single thing that concerns us according to your word, and we will be ever so careful to give you all the glory, all the the honor and all the praise in the matchless name of Jesus we pray somebody shout amen and amen I love you God bless you have a great week